as I was talking with him, uh, it occurred to me, you know, he's a public speaker. He's having to relearn how to speak. It has to be very frustrating. So prayers for him and his therapy, uh, relearning how to speak as a preacher as well. Those are my two bits. Who else do we have? What else do we have? Denise wants prayers for herself. All right. Anything in particular or just yourself? All right. Okay. I was, I was, uh, I was talking with Susan briefly as we got here, you know, when we struggle with God, it, it seems like we have a habit of not being where we need to be. So I'm glad you're here this morning. We often decide, you know, I'm fighting these demons, I'm fighting these devils, and so I'm not going to go to worship, I'm not going to go to church, I'm not going to, that's not going to bring good responses. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here, Denise. We'll pray for you. Who else? Oh, Gentry has COVID. Is he doing well? Is he home? Okay. All right. So Gentry's got a, uh, I, I guess at this point, not a bad case, but he's got a strong case of COVID. So prayers for Gentry. Uh, Nancy, of course, is having to care for him. Prayers for Nancy. What else do we have? Who else do we have? Stan is back home. If you hadn't heard, he is having gravity issues. So pray for his uprightness. He keeps falling. So pray for Stan. I've not heard new news about that. If you, so. Stan Jr. All right. All right. Stan Jr. Surgery was successful. Do we know if he's home recovering or if he's in the hospital? Okay. Probably because they had to do an open chest. So he's probably still in the hospital. because They did that on the 30th. Okay. Uh, what What's the family name? Kalodi? Okay. Uh, I put a C. I will fix that. <laughs> All right. So Joyce's uh, son-in-law, Patrick, his mother is passing prayers for the family as they struggle with that. The family name is Kalodi. So prayers for them. What's his mother's name? Gail. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Joyce is waiting for biopsy results. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today, for blessing us. We thank you for the beautiful weather, Father. We thank you for this day, a day to worship, praise you. And right now, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We pray that you will be with these people that we've listed, these people that are on our hearts. We pray for uh, Mike James as He's got uh, some medical issues. We pray for the doctors and nurses. We pray for good results. We ask that you be with uh, his, his wife, fiance, and ask that you would bless them. We pray for Brad McFall's recovery. We pray that uh, 
you would be with him to heal him, to help him to remember to do this thing that he's done so well for so many years, to speak again and uh, to loosen his tongue and to allow him to be that preacher that he's always been. Father, we uh, we pray for Gentry as he deals with COVID. We pray for Nancy as she cares for him. We pray we pray for good results there, Father, that you would watch over him and bless him. We pray for Stan and his issues of health. We pray that uh, you would watch over him and answers might be found. Same with Joyce. We pray for her in a biopsy. We pray that, uh, again, answers would be found. There would be good results, Father. We, we pray for healing for them. We're grateful for successful surgeries, such as Stan Jr.'s surgery. We pray that he will recover well and be back to his normal self. We pray for uh, Patrick's mother, uh, Gail, we pray for the, the Pilati family. We pray you'll be with them in her passing, that they would remember that you love them greatly. We pray for Denise and her spiritual struggles, Father. Give her strength to rely on you, to look to you, to resist temptation and devil and failure and all the things that get in her way, Father. And we pray for others that are struggling that same struggle. Help us always to look to you because you are our Father and you love us so. Be with us as we open your word, Father. May we learn and grow and be more like you. This is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. All right, we are looking at two different meals today. Uh, we're traveling through the four Gospels chronologically. Roper has combined uh, these two meals that we're going to look at. And then when I get to my sermon, we'll be right in the middle of those two meals. So the first meal is in Luke chapter 10, if you'll be turning there in your Bibles. In Luke chapter 10, in verse uh, 38, we're going to Mary and Martha's and, and uh, un, unspoken of, Lazarus's house as well. He lives with them. We know this from the Gospel of John. Uh, this is in the town of Bethany. I know that Luke doesn't tell us this, but again, we know these things from the Gospel of John. So, verse 38 of Luke 10, we read this. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a village. and A woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. All right, so this lesson here teaches us that, uh, obviously, it's very plain, studying the words of Jesus, sitting at his feet, that takes priority over everything else. Nothing else is important. We don't need to do anything else but study the words of Jesus. That's it. Nothing else. Right? Some of you guys got the look in your eyes like, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> No one ever says it that plainly, and that's obviously not correct, right? But I have heard lots of lessons of, uh, from preachers where they'll tell us, this is the preeminent thing, right? This is, this is the pinnacle. This is the, the thing. Of course she chose the right thing. Of course we need to be doing those things. And, well, now wait a second. 
Martha, verse 40, she's distracted with much serving. See, she's distracted. How dare she when she has the opportunity to sit at, feet, at the feet of Jesus, right? And, and of course, Jesus, he quotes when he is in the wilderness for 40 days and Satan comes before him and says, turn this rock or this stone to bread. Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. And what does he tell us about eating? We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, right? So this is that, right? And the answer, of course, is well, yes and no. And why is it yes and no? Our bodies still need bread. We still need to eat. We can go a long time without eating, despite popular opinion, even myself, we can go a long time without eating. But we still need to eat. If we don't eat, we will die. That's just how our bodies work. We need the energy. So that needs to happen. And is it important? Absolutely. Is it important to sit at the feet of Jesus? Yes. Does that need to happen? Yes. Now, Martha, what she's doing is wonderful. She's serving. And how many scriptures do we have that teach us service? Even, even, uh, even a, 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 a function of church hierarchy is service. That's what the word deacon means. That's what a deacon is supposed to be about, is serving. That's what the word itself means, diakonos, serve. So this is necessary, and so is sitting at the feet of Jesus. So what's the problem? Maybe there's always time to eat your clothes, but there's not always time to sit with Jesus, your clothes. There is a time for each of these things. You still need the food. You still need the service. You still need the Lord. You still need his teachings. And there is a time for both of those. Even, even today... When we have, for example, we, we don't often do it for um, regular service, but when we have a, a lectureship or uh, a, a retreat or uh, a, a ladies' day or, or a men's day, one of those events, we prepare meals, right? While the lessons are going on. It's still while the lesson is going on, isn't it? Right. Is is that mean that those people who are serving in that facility have chosen something less? And the answer is no. And and it's it's fascinating because uh, in the church there's a, a digression a little bit. There's this debate about children's worship, right? Is that permissible or is that not permissible? There's this debate about it, and and one of the one of the things that's always brought up is the teacher is missing from the worship service. And that's true. They're missing from the worship service. But they're serving. And they're serving at a time when the church has chosen to try to teach those little ones how to worship. All of these things, it's... We have, this, we have this attitude of either this or this, and sometimes that's true. It's either this or this, but it's not always. Sometimes it's a both. Do the meals still need to be prepared? Yes. Can you imagine? All right, we're, we're doing a lectureship. 
the lessons being given. We're going to take a break for lunch, but you have to wait 20 minutes while the people who prepare the, the meal get it all put together. What does that do for the lectureship? <laughs> time to talk and mingle. It cuts into the lectureship time, though, doesn't it? And so one of the things that we try to do to try to uh, be aware of and concerned for everybody's time is we have the lectureship, and like you said, the last 10, 15 minutes of that lesson, those are going to work preparing the meal. They go and they prepare that meal so that when we as a group break, that meal is ready, saving some time for everybody. That's what this is about. So here we find Martha. She's doing this thing. She's serving. She's distracted. Doesn't need to be done. Absolutely. The problem, though, is she's busy looking at somebody else. She's looking at Mary. Mary's not helping me. Now, what Mary's chosen is not better. She's chosen, as Jesus says, the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. That's not better. It's just different. Joyce doesn't agree with me over here. She's giving me that look. Uh, the opposite of good? Depending on your definition of good, I would go with bad. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I agree. I feel sorry for Martha as well. <laughs> but see, you're looking at the either or, right? So, again, think about what would happen if Jesus is teaching, everybody is sitting around listening to what he has to say, and then, okay, now, Martha and Mary, we're going to wait while you make the meal, right? So what she's chosen is, is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not the only good thing. He did say that. Mary's chosen the good portion. We think good, bad right? But there's good, and then there's good, and, and then there's other good. Stan's here. Here's other good. It's good to see you, Stan. So, so the, the oftentimes we get into the struggle of if somebody's, and, and think about this, somebody's off doing service while I'm sitting there listening to the lesson. Does that mean that I'm better? Ah, not better. Make up your mind. <laughs> right, Denise. Right. Oh, oh. Denise says they're not serving if they're back there bickering. They're just putting food on the table. I do like your example, though. If one of the, uh, one of the, the ladies says, I want to listen to this one, you guys take the, the serving part. Um, of course, the response should be, by all means, right? The hard part for us, though, is, and you're right, they're not really serving because they're back there bickering. They're doing the work, but they're not serving. Jews got into that habit. They do the 
things God calls them to do, but they're not really worshiping. There's nothing wrong with what Mary is doing in as much as she's preparing the meal. She's carrying out these things that need to be done. Jesus, think about it the other way, which is weird. Jesus isn't helping Martha, is he? That's not the issue. Mary's not helping Martha is not the issue. The issue is Martha wants Mary to help her because she feels everybody should be doing what I'm doing. That's not how it works. And, and Mary has chosen to listen to the teachings of Jesus instead of helping Martha. Could she help her? Yes. Would it make things easier? Probably. But does she have to help her? And the answer is no. Jesus makes that plain. Jesus isn't helping Martha either. No one looks at Jesus and says, man, that Jesus guy, he is such a slacker. Yeah, yeah, but not helping not helping Martha in the work that needs to be done, right? Uh yes. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't prepare it. Remember, he hadn't sent the disciples out with those, past the baskets around anyway. That that's a digression. So this is this is the problem though in the church sometimes, and that is this. It doesn't have to be the meal. And it doesn't have to be the teaching. What it, what it comes down to is, and I struggle with this myself, I'm doing this work, whatever this work is, X, fill in the blank. I'm doing this work, and no one else is helping me. And I'd really love it if somebody else would help me. But you guys aren't. Grr, 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 right? And, and like I said, this is, this is something that I struggle with myself. Is it a good work? Yes. Does it need to be done? Yes. Do I have to have a lot of help? Answer, no. No. And I really love Denise, Denise's take on it, and that is the work is getting done, but it's not really service if I have the bad attitude about it. And that's really important to understand. So that's this meal, having the right attitude. Any questions about it or any more comments? Because otherwise we'll move to the other meal. All right. Chapter 11, the next meal that we're going to look at, in verse 37, Jesus is going to go to a Pharisee's house. Now, he's been to Pharisee's houses before. This is not the first time. And uh, as Roper points out, and it's true, you know, the scriptures make the Pharisees to be bad guys very often, and they are, they are, but not all of them, right? And here's a Pharisee who has invited Jesus to dine with him, and that's important. Um, but they're going to run into an issue really quickly about traditions. Verse 37 of Luke 11, while he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash it uh, before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now, you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees! For you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the law of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. 
And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the sanctuary yes I tell you it will be required of this generation woe to you lawyers for you have taken away the key of knowledge you did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering as he went away from there the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say Do you think he made uh, many friends that day? Do you think your preacher should always say things that you agree with? What should the pe preacher speak? Truth. Jesus is speaking... A Pharisee asks him to dine, so he goes in to recline. A roper says Jesus wasn't looking for a fight. Maybe. But he certainly didn't hold back, did he? And it starts with the Pharisee being astonished to see the not washing. What is, the, what is the washing about? Ritual, yes. Give me more. What, what's it for? Why, why this ritual? Why is it necessary? What do they do? Uh, not, not no not not so that everybody can see them no not not this one there's there's other rituals that they do that are so people can see them not this one right to keep the unclean things from entering so the thought is this unclean things exist in the world and uh, especially with my hands I may touch unclean things as I go through the the day and so when it comes to eating, if I've got unclean things that have touched my hands, my hands become unclean. And so now as I touch my food, my food becomes unclean. And then when I eat that unclean food, which was clean, but it's now unclean because I use my hands. When I eat this food, now my body becomes unclean. So to negate all of that, to avoid all of that, what they do is when they come in from outside, because their house is clean, when they come in, they wash, they go through a ritual washing of hands. This is not about germs and bacteria. This is about clean and unclean Old Testament. So Jesus didn't wash, not because, uh, again, it's not because his hands are dirty, not because of germs and bacteria. He didn't wash because that's the ritual that was determined not by God. God determined clean and unclean. Their ritual of the elders, of the Pharisees, was you wash because you don't know if your hands are unclean or not. So to make sure they're clean, you wash your hands. That's what that's about. And Jesus points out the hypocrisy. Because, again, it's not about germs and bacteria. It's about cleanliness versus uncleanliness scripturally. And so verse 39, he's going to start with the cup and dish, but he really quickly transfers it to what? Their inside. And what's their inside? What is he talking about? Is he talking about their digestive system? No. He's talking about their souls, their spirits, right? So they work really hard to make sure the outward look is stunning. But inside, they're rotten. And that's, that's strange to think about uh, 
let me give you an example. In Alaska, when the salmon spawn, the fish change their shape. And uh, they stop eating. And most notably for the sockeyes, their skin color is going to change as well. You ever see the pictures of the salmon spawning? What color are they? They're bright red, right? Really bright red. They don't look like that when you look, when you, you know, see them caught in the wild, you know, outside of spawning, when, you know, the fishermen are pulling in their nets. They don't look like that. They don't look like that when they're on your dinner plate. Why not? Because you're not eating spawning salmon. And the reason why you don't eat spawning salmon is because those salmon are actually dead. They don't eat when they're spawning and their body starts to decay even while they're alive. They're, they're basically falling apart. Their meat is rotten. People do not eat spawning salmon. This is that same picture. The salmon's still moving. It's still wiggling. It's still doing all the things that, that fish do except for eating. You ever wonder why they don't go fishing for salmon that are spawning? It's because they won't eat. They won't, eat. They won't take the bait. They're dead even as they swim. Here Jesus is describing the same thing with the Pharisees. They look beautiful on the outside. And those sockeye salmon are just amazing. Inside, though, their souls and their spirits, Jesus says in verse 39, are full of greed and wickedness. They're busy doing their makeup and making sure that they look perfect. But they forgot about their soul. In verse 40, he calls them fools. Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount about calling people fools. And what did he say there? Don't do it. Wait a minute, Jesus. Which one is it? Which one is it? Should we not be doing it? Or should we follow the example of Jesus here and do it? He here is speaking about their real and observable hypocrisy. Everybody can see it. When you see that salmon swimming in that stream, bright red, everybody knows that that salmon is spawning. These Pharisees, their hypocrisy is readily observable by everybody, which is amazing. The Pharisees still have power despite their hypocrisy, right? People still, oh, it's the great Pharisees. Let's listen to what they have to say, even though they're filled with hypocrisy. And he's going to point out their hypocrisy, and, and everybody knows their hypocrisy. I always think of politicians, but religious leaders do this too, right? God made the inside as well as the outside. Our body and our souls are made by God. Give as alms those things that are within. What, what are alms? Oh, charity. You just changed the word. That doesn't help us. <laughs> what does it mean? What does charity mean? All right, Laura's going to go to love. That's that's just changing the word again. That doesn't help us either. Gail, go ahead. What did you say? Helping and serving, right? Usually we think of alms as a measurement of money, a monetary measurement, right? And, and it usually is. But how do you give money from the inside, from my spirit, my soul? That's what That's what we're talking about here. Give his alms outwardly what comes from inside of you. And, and that's significant because when it comes to uh, giving, often uh, almsgiving, charity, right, uh, is often the, not always, but it is often the excess, the leftover. Can you give an extra dollar at the grocery store? Can you put some extra change for the orphans in the bucket? Can you, that's often almsgiving for us. And that's not what he's after here at all, is it? 
almsgiving here, it's not about the amount. It's where it comes from. It's from the inside. Give as alms those things that are within. How much is your soul worth? If you do it that way, the end of verse 41 is just so powerful. Everything is clean for you. If I'm concerned with loving God with everything, if I'm concerned with loving my neighbor with everything, then I don't have this concern over, is this clean or not? Because I know the right thing to be doing, the good thing, the life thing. That's the difference. These Pharisees are going through the motions and the rituals, not understanding that washing the hands doesn't touch the soul. We can go through our worship not understanding that our actions don't touch our soul. Is it coming from inside of me? Now, that doesn't mean everything that comes from inside of me is, if I've got God in the focus, if I've got my neighbor in the focus, that's where it's going to be. The Pharisees aren't like that. Verse 42, this is the only place. Well, there's, there's another one that speaks about tithing. Oh, tithing. We do not tithe. Notice here the tithe. What do they tithe? Yeah, mint, rue, and every herb. What does that mean? The smallest plants, right? Ah, these are inconsequential. These are nothing. These are, I just use these to season my foods. They tithed that. Ah, look how. Uh, look how serious I am about God. I make sure even the littlest herbs I tithe, I make sure if I cut nine mint leaves, that tenth one is going to the Levites, going to the orphans. This is how serious tithing is never money. These Pharisees are tithing. This is how serious they are about following those rules, but those rules aren't getting inside of them. Why? Because they neglect justice and the love of God. Notice Jesus doesn't say they shouldn't tithe. He says the exact opposite. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. The Jews are supposed to tithe. And, and by all means, tithe the mint, the rue, the herb. Jew, you're supposed to do those things. But don't forget the justice and the love of God. They're busy with the externals, the outsides, the things that people can see. And you can't see my heart. You can't see, I said heart. You can't see my soul, my spirit. What does that look like? What does your soul look like? How can we tell what somebody's soul looks like? Mm, by their fruits. That's outside. This is so hard, isn't it? <laughs> because if we go back to Mary and Martha, is Martha serving? Yeah, good fruit. Not from the heart. Not from the heart. Verse 43, I, I got to move ahead. Verse 43, what are you Pharisees? You love the best seat in the synagogues. Is it wrong to have the best seat? No, by all means, feel free to move forward, okay? For some reason, the best seat is as far back as we can sit. <laughs> I'm just teasing. We love best seats. Is there anything wrong with best seats? No. Absolutely not. 
if that's our only, that's when we get to the problem. That's our only focus. The Pharisees love the attention. They love people to laud and say, look at this. And, and people do this to me too, and it's so frustrating. This is, this is, the, this is Scott. He's the preacher. He's, he preaches for the Church of Christ. He preaches for my church. He's my preacher. He's uh, just a guy doing my job. The Pharisees had forgotten that, and they loved those best seats. They loved those greetings in the marketplace, and that's what they were after, those things. Now, is it wrong to give honor where honors do? Absolutely not. That's Scripture, right? Is it wrong to give honor where honor isn't due? The answer is yes. This is the problem here. And, and just oh, the heartbreak in verse 44 you are like unmarked graves. People walk over them without knowing it. What does that mean? What's an unmarked grave? <laughs> it is unclean, but it's more than that. What's an unmarked grave? Who, what is a marked grave? Let me ask it that way. Who marks graves? Family, people who love them. An unmarked grave is somebody who's been buried in shame or unknown or unloved. And your grave, Pharisees, people are walking all over you. They don't know it. And you don't know it. That is a terrible thing to say, isn't it? You are in an unmarked grave and people are walking all over you. They have no respect for you. They have no care for you. They have nothing for you. Think about here in the U.S. and other places as well. When we find a graveyard that's been abandoned, uh, the markers got lost, all of that business, what do we do? Let's say we're building a road and we find that there's a cemetery there. What do we do? Okay, we build the road around it. We transfer the cemetery. Why do we do those things? We res do we know them? No. Do we respect them? Yes. Unmarked graves that people walk over without knowing. No respect. Don't care for you. Wow. He moves on, verse 46. The lawyers are like, hey, you're, you're speaking against us too. He's like, okay, let's do this. Lawyers, you're just as bad. Why? Because you load people with burdens hard to bear and you don't help them. Not even one of your little fingers. We Christians should jump at the opportunity to help. Somebody says, help me. Now, the hard part is getting people to say, help me. When people say, help me, what should we be doing? I would love to help you being Christian. Not just help you with X, Y, or Z, but if you're focusing on being the Christian, I would love to help you. Because that's what we're here for. Isn't that what the church is for? Each other, one another, right? The Pharisees have already got the abuse down. We don't want to imitate them. The church asks for help. When Christians ask for help, help me with my walk with God. Help me with my walk in, in, in this way or that way. Or the Help me with my bills. Are you trying to be Christ-like or are you just wasting your money? I want to help you. Paying your bills may not necessarily be help. Helping you to understand why you have those bills may be a better help. Uh, running out of time here. The prophets, they build tombs for the prophets. What he's saying here is they honor the prophets. You guys build great statues and, and uh, great tombs for these prophets. The problem is your fathers killed them. You guys kill your own prophets. So what you're doing is... You're killing them, and then you're turning around and honoring them because, after all, they're the prophets of God, right? But you're never listening to them, obeying them, doing what they say. And so the blood from, of all the prophets from the beginning, Abel, through Zechariah, are on their hands. We could be just as guilty. Oh, we don't kill prophets today. 
Well, we don't have prophets to kill, but are we listening to what the prophets have to say? Or are we building monuments to them? And as he finishes in verse 52, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves. These lawyers are not going where they think they're going. A lot of people think they're going to heaven today. They're not going to get there. Why? What's inside? What's inside? Is all my religiousness outside? Is it all external? What's inside? And I love 53 and 54. They should have repented. They should have said, Scott, you're right. Jesus, you're right. Preacher, you're right. And when the preacher's wrong, the preacher's wrong. When the preacher's right, some people don't want to hear the truth. And rather than repenting, what do they do? Try to trap him. These are those two meals. There's a lot of externals looked at here. And they are worthless compared to what's in our hearts, what's in our spirit, our soul. Do we love God? Do we love our neighbor? That's the question. Next week, oh, I've gone way over. Next week, we will be in pages... 90 through 113 in Roper's commentary. If you're following along, I appreciate that. Roper's volume 2, pages 90 through 113. Thank you, class.